From implementing tricky business plans to getting buy-in from your staff, our next guest says advances in brain science can help executives become more effective leaders. Here to tell us how understanding your brain can boost your bottom line is Dr. Srini Pillay. He's professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. He's the author of a number of books, including his latest, Your Brain and Business, The Neuroscience of Great Leaders. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks very much for having me. Well, uh, let's just get right to basics uh, to start here. Um, how is neuroscience transforming our understanding of uh, leadership? Well, I, I think the, the basic concept is that, in general, when we think about businesses, we think about businesses as being affected by leaders, and within these leaders are brains. And so uh, up until now, the way we've been trying to understand how leaders work is by observing their behavior through the lens of organizational psychology. And what neuroscience does is it takes us beyond just the observable into the brain that directs that leader in the business environment. So maybe you could give us an example. I read this very interesting sentence you wrote in your book. Not all leaders who become great leaders can stay there, and not all leaders who become great leaders actually get there. Can you explain to us what it is about what happens in the brain that e brings about either one of these outcomes? Sure. Well, you know, when it comes to, to leadership, leadership is, uh, is a function and it's determined by a set of capacities. Um, and a lot of leaders suddenly find themselves uh, in very senior positions uh, without actually understanding how they got there. And that's partly because a lot of important functions that lead to leadership success are actually unconscious. So what they develop is what we call the imposter syndrome, where leaders suddenly feel as though they really don't know how they got there and they're actually imposters. And up until now, we've not really understood that the brain is actually capable of registering uh, you know, techniques, strategies, emotions, all of those things unconsciously. And so when leaders suddenly find themselves ahead, they suddenly begin to question how they got there. And as soon as they start questioning, they lose their spontaneity, they lose their ability to make decisions, and the brain that is in the state of doubt and fear begins to decompensate. As a result of decompensating, these leaders then get worse and worse because they start to fear that their first uh, moment when they're not achieving success is actually an indication of their true potential. Now, how are you uh, defining this uh, and building this analysis scientifically? Are you looking at people's brains using uh, image resonancing? What, what's the actual science behind uh, the assumptions that you've just made? Well, so what, what we know, uh, let's take one of the factors that I mentioned, which is fear. Um, what we know is when we put people, you know, one of the uh, questions that's always come, that always comes up is, is there really an unconscious and how do we know that unconscious fear can actually impact the brain? Well, what we do is when we put people in a brain imaging scanner and we present images to them that they can see and that they know, this activates the fear center of the brain, which is the amygdala. And the fear center is connected to, to the decision-making center and to the part of the brain that assesses risk. So when there are these earthquakes in the amygdala, they actually spread to the frontal cortex of the brain and start to affect decision-making. But what we had not known until more recently is that when you show pic people pictures outside of conscious awareness for about 10 to 30 milliseconds so that when you ask them, what did you see, they have no idea that they've seen a fearful face or a threatening face. Even though they don't know that they've seen a face, the brain's anxiety center or fear center, the amygdala, starts to activate. And as a result of that, even though they are not consciously feeling anxious, this activated amygdala begins to disrupt functioning of the thinking brain, which is involved in decision making and, uh, and as I said, risk assessment and a number of other functions. Um, in fact, this effect is so dramatic that even in people who have a certain form of blindness, uh, known as cortical blindness, where their brains cannot interpret images and as a result they can't see, if you present images of fear or threat to people who are blind, the, their amygdala will still activate. So and what this says to us... Sorry, go ahead. Sure, pl please go ahead. No, what does it say to us? <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what I was going to say was, uh, you know, because this unconscious fear affects the thinking brain, um, in a number of situations, this is relevant to the business environment. So, for example, everything from, you know, if you just had a, a fight with your spouse and you show up at work, or if you're next to someone 
who's consistently anxious, or you, if you're in a situation where you have a boss who's a bully, all of those things at a certain threshold of stress or anxiety can activate the brain even if you're using your coping resources to try to not feel anxious. And the bottom line about this is that when it impacts the amygdala, it disrupts the frontal cortex. And one of the business facts we know about this is that the opposite of this, which is trust, actually deactivates the amygdala. And studies on social intelligence show us that when trust is increased, and you can measure this using instruments like social intelligence instruments, when trust is increased, it can actually increase productivity and profits by 6%. Well, that's what I wanted to talk to you about because, you know, there's always that debate in, 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 when you're working in business. Is it better to have somebody who emits positive emotion, who's supportive, or a boss that is, is harsher and more difficult and maybe has kind of negative but at the same time is demanding more of you? What have you found in terms of when you look at how the brain works, what is better in terms of, in terms of productivity? Well, what we do know is that, you know, in general, it's on a case-by-case -case basis to tell the truth. But if we had to generalize about this, what we do know is that stress in relation to productivity works in a U-shaped curve. So up until a particular point, a certain amount of stress can actually focus your attention. And we see these changes in the brain activation, where regions such as the anterior cingulate cortex, and again, in, in the business environment, you don't have to know those names. You can just know that the brain's attentional center starts to work in a better way, and you can focus in a better way. However, after a certain critical point, that stress ceases to work. And the brain then becomes burdened because the anxiety center is overactivated. And as a result of that, it's very difficult to, to be productive. So it is a U-shaped phenomenon. In the early stages, stress can actually be organizing. It can help people focus, whereas in the later stages, it can actually be disruptive. Now, can we train our brains if we understand these underlying uh, rules and structures and chemistry? Can we surmount that? Can we go beyond that perceived biological limitation to, to be more effective leaders and managers? Absolutely. In fact, you know, Neurobusiness Group uh, does this kind of work. And what we've done is when we work with leaders, we, we use brain-based targeting um, to inform us in our strategies about how to reorganize things. So for example, if you want to reach the unconscious directly, uh, there are two constructs that have been examined by the research. One is called cognitive reflection, which is the usual mode that people use when they're trying to deal with their anxiety or stress. They think, they ask, why? Why am I feeling this way? I've got to try to understand this logically. And what the studies show is that if you use cognitive reflection as opposed to emotional introspection in situations where your anxiety is really high, the cognitive reflection which is asking why and why and why, and, and the emotional introspection act very differently on the amygdala. Emotional introspection simply means placing your attention either on where you feel the emotion in your body or on your breath, but without any judgment and without asking any questions. And when you do that, the amygdala deactivates. Whereas when you ask lots of questions in a high stakes situation, there's a point at which amygdala activation is overboard. Mm -hmm. So that's an example where you can teach someone how to go through this procedure of emotional introspection so that they can change their amygdala activation. Okay, in addition that, to that... Yeah, uh, unfortunately we're out of time, but this is absolutely uh, fascinating stuff. And uh, boy, I'm going to try to rewire my brain and uh, read your book. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming on the show.